everybody. I'm Matt, and this is Matt Adulting. Today, we're going to be back in the truck for a little while, and not because I'm going to be telling you how to drive or how not to drive, but we're going to be telling a story about driving, and so I figured I'd go ahead and record this while I'm on my drive into work. A few weeks ago, real quick Chris, man that's hard to say actually, um, he posted a video about a truck that hit a tree by his house and was talking about how his house has been hit before and how that tree's been hit before and started talking about uh, you know what accidents or wrecks or anything like that that you've seen, what you've responded to, what you've helped with, and I had made a comment about some uh, pretty interesting stuff that I've seen. And so I'm gonna go ahead and respond to that with the one that comes to mind first. In uh, 2001, I was driving from Augusta uh, back over to the Atlanta area. I'd been staying with my parents. I was moving back uh, up to the area and moving into a house. And I had already borrowed my dad's truck. I'd taken pretty much everything that I had except for a few things that needed to just stay in my car. And the, on this trip, I was in the car. Um, so I'm on I-20 heading westbound. And I was somewhere, I think, mile marker 135-ish. Uh, every time I pass by there, I know exactly where I'm, uh, where this happened, but I don't ever remember the mile marker number. But anyway, so I'm heading along. I top a hill, and I'm heading downhill, and down in front of me, the the road sweeps kind of gently off to the left, and uh, it's a long, long downhill with a long uphill on the other side. Nothing very major. And as I top that hill and I'm looking across all this, I see a car going really, really fast that crosses into the median. And it crosses into the median and it comes out on our side, it goes airborne, it lands on the shoulder of my side uh, and heads down and off towards the woods. And then it hits something and it flies up in the air as it disappears off into the trees. And, uh, I mean, I got on the brakes as hard as I could. I got slowed down, I got over, and I ended up stopping basically where he entered the woods. At the same time, there was a whole bunch of cars that all were scrambling to not get hit as he was crossing over the interstate. Um, uh, some of them kept going, some of them stopped. Uh, some people from both directions actually stopped and uh, headed into the woods. And there was another gentleman and myself that were in the woods first and got to this car. And uh, it was really mangled. Uh, there wasn't a body panel on that that wasn't damaged. Every one of the windows was blown out. The car was still trying to run, not well, but it was trying to run. I could smell gasoline, um, uh, you know, just overall bad condition. Um, so I climbed in through one of the broken windows and I shut off the car and I, I was like instantly covered in blood. This guy was hurt really bad. Well, the guy that went into the woods with me, that got there first um, with me, uh, started yelling that he was an army medic and he took control of the scene immediately. Um, which is really cool that somebody who has the training for understanding how to deal with a, um, a sudden event, a traumatic event like that, was there. Uh, it's uh, absolutely amazing. And so... Uh, he yells for somebody else who had followed us into the woods to go to his Jeep and grab a few bags that were in the back while he started directing me on what he wanted me to do. And it started with just kind of getting stuff off of this guy, getting it out of the way while he was starting to try and talk to him, communicate, evaluate what was going on with him. And then uh, when the guy got there with the bag, um, 
this guy, you know, pulled out gloves, pulled out um, a whole bunch of cleaning supplies, different things like that. And he had me wipe up with some form of sterile cloth and then directed me to put my fingers inside of a hole in this guy's neck. That's the first time I realized where most of this blood was coming from. Um, apparently, when whatever that was they had hit, which I ended up finding out later was uh, a drainage culvert, um, the thing that he hit that flung him up in the air, it had broken the windows then, but the impact was like from below the car that heaved it up, which didn't set off airbag sensors because it wasn't a frontal impact. When he ran into a tree in the air, it set off the airbags, and so all the glass that was already flying around in his car, um, uh, some of that was in front of him, and the airbag ended up becoming a claymore. So it shot glass, shards, and other stuff into him. And um, he had a wound right up in here. Um, that from what this medic could tell, um, he was bleeding from an artery and I was put to putting my finger in a hole in this guy's neck. Um, the other, uh, the, the medic kept working on him, taking care of a few things. Of course, we're waiting for, um, you know, guys with flashing lights and sirens to show up. Uh, this medic had called in on his cell phone, um, and actually had somehow, I'm not sure how, gone ahead and gotten them spinning up a life flight because it was probably three minutes after the police showed up that a life flight helicopter was landing in the middle of the interstate. And um, yeah, uh, absolutely amazing. And once those guys in the helicopter showed up, uh, the world got real busy real quick as they were taking care of him, getting him ready so that they could transport him. And one of them told me that I needed to go help clear a whole, uh, a whole bunch of underbrush to be able to give him a path to be able to get him out of there. So me and a whole bunch of people that didn't know each other, didn't know this guy, all uh, started ripping down little bushes and briars and brambles and small trees and stuff like that to clear a path to get this guy out to the chopper. Now, I walked away from this whole thing when once he was in the chopper, got in my car, drove down the road, um, and went to go clean up at the first exit, which was exit 130. And I went into the Waffle House there and went in the bathroom with a change of clothes um, and went into the bathroom with a change of clothes there and started cleaning up and when I came out I was greeted with some cops with guns because people at the Waffle House called 911 and said hey this guy just came in completely covered in blood and is in our bathroom and of course the cops show up because they didn't know if I had just like killed somebody or something and so came out to guns drawn and down on the ground and all this other stuff and then one of the cops that was there actually had been at the scene where the wreck happened and recognized what had gone on so um years later many years later i was sitting at a bar in downtown augusta talking with somebody and we were talking about different things that we'd seen uh stuff that we'd experienced and we were talking about wrecks and i brought up this wreck and the, their, their face just started blanching white and they got this weird look and they said, okay, stop. Then they called somebody and told them uh, a little bit about what I was saying and said, okay, I'll see you in a little bit. And lo and behold, who shows up? It was dude. Um, he had survived. I never knew all those years what had happened with him. But he had survived, and you know he had scars and all this other stuff, and um, apparently he had a seizure at the wheel. That's what caused the whole thing, and he's got major seizure problems. No longer allowed to drive. Um, he's got some injuries that were lasting from that wreck, uh, but the the thing that's keeping him from driving was the seizures. So it was really awesome in the end to be able to. Um, to meet the guy and actually talk to him and know 
that he was alive, know how the whole story turned out rather than, well, this guy got thrown into a helicopter and I never saw him again. So in that clip, I didn't tell you what I learned from that experience. I just kind of told the story and then stopped because I had to get into work. But uh, the thing that I learned at that point was that my natural instinct uh, in a situation that's like that is actually to run into the problem rather than run away or ignore it. Um, I didn't know that until that point. And uh, I mean, I had, uh, I had gone towards problems before to help. Um, uh, I'd help put out a fire in a car at a church. Uh, and I'd done some other stuff like that. But um, this was the first time that I'd really like put myself at a real risk for a stranger. And um, turns out that that's actually been an instinct that I had. Um, another takeaway from that, something that I learned, was that I needed to keep stuff in my truck, in my car, whatever I had, that uh, I'd never thought of before. So I have a pretty decent little uh, first aid kit that rides in my truck. I actually ha carry a fire extinguisher. Uh, main reason for that was actually from uh, another car fire that I helped with. I uh, realized that uh, there was a lot of time taken up by running across a parking lot to get one out of a store. But uh, th that, that experience taught me that I needed to have things on hand to match what my instinct was going to tell me that I needed to do and go in to help. If you're going to go in and help, you better have some knowledge, but you better have some tools too. So, uh, that's the end of this one. Just one story today, no uh, other stuff. But, uh, thanks for watching.